Hello, my name is Björn. I work for a company called Grafana Labs, which you might have heard about, um, but for a much longer time I've been working for a project called Prometheus that you almost certainly have heard about. If not, what are you doing here? This is PromCon, right? All right, um, so if you know me, you know that I have an infamously favorite topic in um, Prometheus land, which is histograms. And once more, I'll talk about histograms. A new kid in histogram town, which you might know, is a reference to this very first, almost very first commit in the Prometheus Prometheus repo, November 2012 ancient times, right? Matt Proud himself uh, committed this. And the first sentence here is Bedecke dein Himmelzeus, a new kid is in town. A mysterious reference. I mean, in the days of web search, nothing is mysterious. You just paste it into Google and then you know what it is. But let's keep the suspense here. I'll, I'll tell, I'll talk about the first part of this mysterious reference in a mysterious language. Uh, as the last thing in the talk, so you have something to look forward to. Now let's call it about the new kid is in town. That's where I took my title from, right? So back then Prometheus was a new kid in town. Nobody, or at least not very many, had an idea how to do monitoring in that way. Um, and then Prometheus became very famous and it's not so new anymore. So this is probably why, why this, this sentence is not in the readme anymore. Um, anyway, uh, back then, the interesting part is that Prometheus was new, but it was not like unheard of. There were a few people, mostly working at Google, I guess, that, that knew this kind of monitoring. And um, yeah, and then there was theory about this, how monitoring works and everything. So this is not like Prometheus essentially made this available for, for everyone in the open source world, but it... It's, it's like it wasn't fundamentally new that nobody had heard about all those ideas before. And that's a similar thing like um, fractal self-referential repetition of history or something with histograms, right? So they are super new. So new kid in histogram town will have very, very new histograms in Prometheus. But those histograms are like not really new. They, they are based on ideas that have been around for long, for longer than Prometheus actually. And um, just very basic idea. It's just the challenge is more like how can we make them fit into the Prometheus way of doing things. And that's a lot of my recent work about. And also um, another idea here is that yeah, I've been talking about histograms forever, right? So this is not really new, but it's still very new. And yeah, so I've been talking about this forever. Especially you could uh, watch this trilogy of talks. Um, interestingly, the first part of the trilogy is newer than the second. It's kind of a prequel, but we know this, right? Um, and this is about kind of why histograms haven't materialized yet, the new style histograms. Uh, kind of the history, how we knew that the existing histograms are kind of a prototype, but we got stuck with them for some reason. And then certain events happened that made it even harder to, to like follow up with the old ideas. Uh, so this is kind of this first part. Um, it's kind of a bit funny, recreational. The second part is the most important one, as often with trilogies. Um, it was supposed to also talk about the past, it didn't, which didn't happen. So that's why there's a first part now, a prequel. So the second talk talks about what we are, present state as of 2019, PromCon, two years ago, uh, and the future, what options do we have, um, where to go. Uh, so that's very important to understand where we are. And then the third part of the trilogy is KubeCon last year, KubeCon EU, but it's online anyway, so you can watch it. Um, this is essentially after some research where I proposed what to do quite concretely already. Um, and I also announced a, famously, <laughs> I announced a design doc that, that will come out just after the talk. In reality, it took a bit longer. So this uh, got published in February this year not so long ago, but here it is. It's epic, 26 pages or something. So totally read it if you are this type of person, but uh, if you think this is too much effort, just watch the talks and 
it will be also okay, right? So this went through various rounds of review and uh, we discussed it at the Prometheus Dev Summit and agreed that this is the way to go. So this is kind of the, the baseline on which we are working now. I mean, mostly it's me, but I hope that I get help. I need help from various experts and also like, yeah, contributors were asking, what can I do? And I told them I first have to come up with the master plan before we can even do anything, right? So this is the master plan, here it is. Uh, okay, what is this talk about? This talk is kind of a showcase what, what already works and what are the kind of, yeah, very, very um, imminent next steps to do. So there, there's a slide from the original trilogy third talk, uh, but as I said, I will not repeat those talks. And um, actually, if you have never seen any of the, uh, like if you have no clue what I'm talking about right now, it will be also hard to follow the rest of this talk. But this is online, right? You can stop the, st the stream now and you can watch those other talks or read the design doc. Um, or you can just keep watching and then later read it up and understand everything. But in a nutshell, right? Very shortly, this is how the new histograms look like. They have, they embrace sparseness. So empty buckets might happen all the time, uh, but they don't cost anything. Um, in turn, they have an infinite amount of buckets, right? <laughs> so um, they, they, they look like the same, all those buckets, but this is only because the X axis here is logarithmic. So it's exponential bucket from zero to infinity and actually from zero to negative infinity, but I haven't drawn this here. There's a resolution parameter which tells you how many buckets every power of 10 has. So after every power of 10, you have a guaranteed like round um, um, bucket boundary. And then the mathematically inclined might already have noticed that uh, around zero, you will have an infinite density of buckets. So there's a zero bucket of a certain very small width where just all the observations in this very small interval are falling into this so-called zero bucket. That's how they look like, and that's how we encode them in the exposition format. Um, so the actually populated bucket are marked down as spans, and then within each bucket, we, uh, we just have deltas between one bucket and the next. We don't record the absolute value in each bucket. They, those numbers could grow quite a bit, but the deltas in between are usually smaller because buckets just like, I mean, in a very chaotic distribution, this might not work out, but in reality, you have kind of smooth distributions. So going from one bucket to the next is usually a small step and smaller numbers. If you do some kind of far end encoding can be encoded in fewer bytes. And that's how it works out on the wire. This is, by the way, kind of built in into Protobuf. That's one of the ideas of Protobuf, which is also the reason why we're kind of bringing back Protobuf format for at least experimenting with the new histograms. Uh, we'll certainly not just bring back the old Protobuf format in the final release code, um, but like you should notice that OpenMetrics has a Protobuf option. So this is probably something more like the direction to go in the end. But for now, we just experiment with old protobuf format extended for those new histograms. All right, um, this is enough about old slides. Now I want to show what is already there. Um, the, as you could already have guessed, the development is kind of in flux. So we don't do this in main. It is also quite invasive, which is another reason why we can't just hide this behind a feature flag or something. So there will be development in a separate branch for now, and the branch will be called sparse histogram in various repos. Um, at some point, this will be uh, ready to go into main. Perhaps this is the point where we cut Prometheus 3, but we, we don't have to decide that right now, right? This is where we experiment in a branch. Prometheus Prometheus is where the meat is, right? So it's uh, TSDB, PromQL, ingestion. But of course we have to start with exposition and we have to pick an exposition library for that. And as I already hinted, we're using Protobuf, the old Protobuf format and the only official exposition library that still is backed by the original Protobuf data model and format is Klein Golang. So we just use that one. Also, we all like Go, right? So kind of nice coincidence. 
The original protobuf format is described in the Klein model repository, which also will have a sparse histogram branch, right? So that's the idea here. All right, um, let's look at the changes. Um, in Klein model, that's really very little. These are all the changes. And now you see how easy it is. You have this sparse bucket resolution. You have the width of the zero bucket. You have the count of observation in the zero bucket. And then you have negative and positive sparse buckets, which both are just a series of spans with offset and length and the deltas between one bucket and the next. And as said, if you pick the right data type here in Protobuf, you'll get var int encoding for free on the wire. So this is a very efficient um, way of encoding those sparse histograms without doing a lot of special, super fancy bitwise encoding or something. So that's super easy to, to get done and it's already quite efficient and might actually be in the sweet spot between encoding effort and, and size on the wire. This is all discussed in detail in the design doc. But these are all the changes we need in Klein model. Pretty cool. Uh, changes in Klein Golang are fairly um, involved, so I can't show them on a single slide, but I can demo them. Okay, so here we are. This is a simplistic, minimalistic little program that exposes just a single histogram. To do that, I'm not using the default registry. I use a custom registry here so that I don't have any weird default metrics, just a histogram. You see, this is completely standard. This is nothing new yet. Uh, and the buckets I define, I'd use the exponential buckets helper here to define 13 buckets. And I use, I calculate the factor here. And this is the mathematic behind the um, width of the buckets in the sparse histogram. So I used the old histograms but define bucket boundaries that will coincide with the bucket boundary of the sparse histogram. You don't have to do this. I'm just doing it to demonstrate something I'll talk about in a second. Register this. Now simulate observations. So I simulate an observation every 10 milliseconds. So it's kind of as if we are serving 100 requests per second from this pseudo service binary or something. And I use random numbers that are normally distributed 200 milliseconds plus minus 50 milliseconds standard deviation so that we get a bit of a distribution, right? And we run this in a go routine, serve metrics, that's it, right? Okay, let's look at this, how it will work out. Go run demo.go and already runs, right? Uh, let's check this out. Let's curl the metrics endpoint, um, EAD, metrics. There it is. I mean, so far, nothing new, right? This is the classical histogram. Ideally, as said, this should uh, have a round bucket boundary at every power of 10, uh, floating point precision, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't really work out, but you, you, you get the idea, right? You can already see how we accumulate observations, right? And most of them are kind of ending up in, in this bucket here. Uh, this is cumulative, like it goes up and up and up, but like the delta between bucket is kind of what is actually in the bucket. It's also a delta. <laughs> um, and you see this is such a low resolution that most of the observations just end up in this one bucket here. And uh, we, we are going to change that, right? So let's um, go back to... Um, my code um, here. Uh, I prepared this so I don't typo again, mistype anything. So this is the only line you have to add. Um, and I told you I want a default resolution of 32 for these sparse buckets. Right now in the code, the default resolution is, the default behavior is don't use sparse buckets, right? Uh, and now this just adds sparse buckets to the normal histogram in addition to the normal buckets. Uh, so it tracks everything in parallel, so we can look at it in parallel. But this is why I use this interesting uh, bucket layout. If the buckets in the conventional histogram are just coinciding with boundaries in the new sparse bucket, the library could totally just use sparse buckets and then render the conventional buckets in a certain way. I mean, it can't render an infinite amount of buckets, but it could render like those 13 buckets if you want them uh, based on the data on the sparse histogram. So it only has to track the sparse histogram. 
Right now the code isn't doing this optimization, you just get both in parallel, so you could still do the old stuff. Okay, now let's run this one. Um, um, you know what's happening here. Stop it, run it. Uh, and of course, the existing released uh, client Golang library doesn't know anything about sparse pocket resolution. So what we have to do is use go get with go modules to tell go to fetch something from the sparse histogram branch. Um, this is the way to do. So remember this if you want to play with it on your own. You just do this um, and then Go modules creates the pseudo version. It's not 1.10.0 anymore, but 1.10.1. It's also pinned to a certain commit hash. Uh, you can actually look at go mod to see how this works, right? So now uh, it has pinned this year, and even it has noticed, but this will happen automatically thanks to what's in client Golang that it also pins to a certain version of client model, which is not in the main branch, so that nobody is confused who is actually using this normally. Okay, now it should just work. Go run demo. Um, seems to work. So let's curl this again. And um, as you can see, nothing has changed. This is kind of, what's the word? Anticlimactic, right? <laughs> so the reason is that the text format is very, very not suited at all to represent those sparse buckets in an efficient way. It's all done in the protobuf format, which, as I told you, we are bringing back in Prometheus just for this experiment. And Klein Golang never left this path of virtue. Um, so we can just tell to the current day that is possible, right? Any Go binary that instrumented with Prometheus Klein Golang can, um, can be asked to serve protobuf. And you do this by adding this little header, um, hit enter. Now curl is very friendly and tells us this is horrible binary stuff. If I dump this onto your terminal, it will all beep and go whatever. Haywire. Um, so it is not doing this and that's cool. Um, but how do we how do we look at the new stuff, right? So there's a little known secret. Um, I mean, there's the text format of Prometheus and there's the protobuf format of Prometheus, but you can actually represent protobuf in a text form. So now it's, it's get, get, getting deeper, right? This is the text format of the protobuf format. If you just say encoding equals text. And that also works with every client Golang uh, instrumented binary, you can do this at home if you want, right? So now you see the protobuf in a very verbose form. On the wire, usually this is the binary form, which is very dense, right? So you see here in, in even more verbose than the normal text format, this is the conventional histogram. And now you get the new stuff. So you get the sparse pocket resolution of 32, the threshold. You see we have two spans here. One is just one pocket, like one very low value observation. And then we have 10 consecutive, sorry, 34 consecutive pockets. 10 empty buckets later, and here are all the deltas, and you see, as promised, they are all quite small. They only get larger around the peak here, right? And then the minus means this is where the buckets become less populated again. Um, yeah, this is this is how they look uh, in protobuf. We can't even see explicit boundaries and everything because this is all implicitly encoded in the convention. What does the resolution number means? but they, they more or less coincide with those buckets, like I said. You could make the library render the conventional histogram at no additional cost, essentially. And um, the scrapers that want the old histogram could still have this, but you have to pick buckets. You cannot expose an infinite number of buckets. Okay, that's the demo. Um, let's go back to uh, the slides. Prometheus, Prometheus, that's what we're all interested in, right? Um, so the problem here is that um, uh, this is actually the hard part, right? I'm currently working on ingesting the protobuf format, not in the super optimized form that uh, is, has been implemented for the text format. It could be done by hand coding a protobuf parser, but yeah, not doing this anytime soon. This is just for experiments. And as I said, we will, we will find out what's the final choice of how to represent the new histograms on the wire and how to ingest them. Uh, so that's easy to work on. Just check out if you watch this, there might actually be something working 
in the Spa Cicerone branch. The hard but also very rewarding part is to teach the TSV to save those new histograms in an efficient way. And this is where I hope for like TSV experts to help. And then here be dragons, that's how PromQL um, should uh, do all of this. To be like to to make full use of the new histograms, you kind of need new concepts in PromQL where you actually act on a histogram with a potential infinite number of buckets. Like yeah, you cannot just um, represent them all as individual time series from the point of view of PromQL. But to be again compatible, you can again create this kind of view of a uh, new sparse histogram. Uh, and, and, and present it as a conventional histogram with a selected number of conventional buckets. So that's kind of a migration path. But yeah, in the, in the, the like shiny new world, we have a PromQL that can actually act directly on, on sparse histograms and recording rules that can spit out new sparse histograms and all those things, right? So that's really, really tough to get right. So um, don't, don't be too, like this won't be done next month or something. All right, we are done here. Um, and uh, as promised, resolution for Bedecke dein Himmelzeus. That's of course German. I think Matt back then was really into German. And um, what's the greatest literary figure of uh, modern German? That's a person called Goethe here. I like him. I just sometimes put Goethe Easter eggs into my talks. You might not have noticed. So now it's very explicit, right? But it's not even my Easter egg. It was kind of Matt, who put this Easter egg into it. It's an awesome poem, awesome mega rant against the gods, mostly Zeus. <laughs> um, so um, you could uh, now think why this, what this has to do with Prometheus. There's one obvious reference, of course, the title of this poem is Prometheus. So perhaps Matt just wanted to tell us, I'm all now also writing a Prometheus, like, like Goethe did. Everyone should write a Prometheus once in their life or something. Anyway, that was it. Um, here you can see all my talks and how to reach me and uh, we still have Q&A. So see you in the QI. Bye bye.